I guess that you know that uh, Marty and Debbie and Matthew went to Haiti, and they're not back yet, and I'm, at least I don't believe they're back. And they went to see about the work there. The church at Choctaw helped support the work that goes on in Haiti at Jean Terard Elmira. And so they're going, and they were there working and helping with uh, the Britain Road congregation. I think it's Ron Beaver, or I'm not sure if I got the first name right. But anyhow, we help support that work, and it's a, it's a good thing. And Michael Maslongo and Lees had gone to Red River, the Red River encampment, and they're out there, and Mike was his scheduled speaker, and uh, I think all the days that it, the, the thing went on. And uh, he was also there. Part of what he was trying to do was to display and tell about uh, the BibleTalk.tv that we have, that we that have the opportunities for people learning more about Jesus Christ through the Internet. And so he's talking about that, so we're hoping and praying that that'll be successful as well, and uh, they'll be back, and I think they should both be back this weekend as far as I know. And uh, Dade and Cassie and Ruth have been the world travelers, I think. They went to some place called uh, Indiana. That's, I think that's north of the border of the United States. I'm not sure how, but it's when you're driving it, you probably think it's a long way up there. Welcome back, Dayton. Glad you're back. And, so anyhow, we're, we're, we're greatly blessed as a people, and so we have a great opportunity to honor Jesus Christ as we live. And so, you know, we, we started this study series, and it's not my intent to do a detailed verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Acts, and we'll only get, we'd be lucky to get halfway through it. But my intent is in this particular class, what can we look and what can we find that are applications that will help us live? It, it, it's useful, I think. Oftentimes we sit in a Bible class and we study and we know how to conjugate the verbs and we know all the, some of the Greek words. And, but ultimately, it gets down to how can I apply what the Scriptures teach? How can that be part of my life? How can that be part of the church? Because the title of this study is the church that shines. And so I'd like to focus our attention then on the church that shines, but it's the church that shares life. And so it's Acts chapter 2, the last part of it. And so these are the scriptures that I'd like for us to read. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals with gladness, together with gladness and with sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those that were being saved. So that becomes a, a, a pretty good viewpoint of what we're trying to look at. And uh, let's see, I got... Uh, well, I guess I just skipped a couple. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. But anyhow, let me just read a couple charts that I had here. All those who had believed were together and they had all things common. Now, when, the point that this would have said is that when we grasp Jesus' love for us, we experience the power of God at work in our lives. When we can really grasp a hold of that, it's, a more, it's more for us than just a faith. I think that would be important to me. And they were touched by His love and by His mercy and His grace. And when we have that, we're changed as well. So the church that shines out the love of God in a way they share life with each other and in things which they were devoted. So the church that shines lives out the love of God. Well, the church does that as a group, but it does that through the fact of each individual letting our lives shine for God. And so we share life with each other in the things to which they were devoted and for us to which we were devoted. So Acts 2.42 through 47 is a picture of devotion. Now as we go through this, I hope maybe you just kind of let your mind go as we begin to look at what devotion is all about. 
It describes our, how our devotion to Jesus is lived out daily. We look at how they lived out their late daily lives. And so I think it has an impact on how we can, what can we learn from what we see there that we can apply to our daily lives, you see. The church that mirrors the person of Jesus devotes itself to deliberately sharing the life of Christ. So I think as we go through life, at least my goal is we go through life, each day I would like to be more like Jesus Christ. I would like that to be a goal that I have set. My goal is not to live to be 75 or 80 or 90. My goal is to be more like Jesus Christ, and my goal is ultimately to have that home in heaven. You see, that's my goal. So day by day, Jeannie had a song that Jane brought home one day. I, I tried to learn it. I, could, I just about got it. Little by little, day by day, Jesus is helping me in every way or something like that. But it, it, had, it was a cute little verse, but the point was, Jesus is helping me day by day in every way. And so I think we go through life looking at life that way. I don't go through life and say, oh, woe is me. i got a terrible day ahead. I look at life and say, boy, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and he's blessed me and promised me a home in heaven. I have a great, day, I have a great deal before me. Things may not be so good, but I, with the Lord's help, things will be good whether they're good or not. I can make them good. I have that choice. And you have that choice as well. That, that's how I see life. Now, you might see it a little differently than that, but that's how I see it. So the church that mirrors the person of Jesus Christ, it has a heart that is devoted to God's Word, fellowship, each other breaking bread, and with prayer. So when we talk about being devoted, devotion, let's look at the, the, what the word means. And so the devotion is defined as ardent, which means characterized by a warm feeling typically expressed in eagerness uh, or zealous support for an activity or something that you choose to give your time and effort to. So it's often selfless, affection, and dedication as to the person or principle. So ardent means we're really dedicated to it. So that's what devotion really means. My fundamental look at what the... What that what the people in the first century church, what they perceived when they became Christians, they had their sins forgiven. They had that home in heaven. They were devoted. You see? So when I try to look at my life and pattern my life, I really want to be devoted. I want to be devoted to the principle that Jesus Christ had laid out and what the apostles taught in Acts chapter 2 is a good way to get that started. The primary means by which we know God is through His Word. So, first of all, they were devoted to the Word. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, it says, but they were devoted to God's Word. The apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit. What they taught is God's Word. And so, they were devoted to that. The primary means by which we know God is through His Word. So, there's a lot revealed in the Scriptures to tell us about God. And so, if you want to know about God... What do you need to do? In the book. He's, he's giving you... All, I don't know how many pages my Bible has got in it, but boy, it's got a lot. There's a lot in there you can learn. Sunday morning, we have a very interesting Bible class about the different names of God. That's a, that, we can learn a lot from that. So it's in the book. And so if you're going to try to be devoted to God, I think it's almost essential. Day by day... Little by little, Jesus blesses us in every way when we get in the book. And you, you can't avoid that. Now, I, I know some would say, and I, I've done this myself years ago, but when we was going to school at Stillwater, I used to, I used to get up every morning and study at 4 o'clock. That's, that's my goofy time of doing it. I couldn't study at night. So the point would be, when I go to Bible class and we went to the church in Stillwater, what did I do? I was just exhausted. I didn't, I didn't have much time to spend in the Scriptures. And even as later on, I began, you know, when you go to work, you got, you got things you got to do. And, you know, if you're not, but as you get older and as you get more into it, you begin to see the great, huge benefit of being into the Word. So I would suggest that, you know, daily, we must be in the Word daily, reading it and trying to learn with a focus on I'm trying to be more like Jesus Christ. I believe that's what, that's what I would choose to say. That, that's my goal, at least. 
So it is in the pages of the Bible that God has chosen to reveal himself and to call us into a relationship with him. Devoting ourselves to study, memorization, meditation, and God's word is a tool and a pathway that leads us to the presence of God. Would I ever be in God's presence by reading the word? Well, not physically, but I can be drawn closer. I can see more what God is like. I can almost, I, in my mind, when I read, I can imagine what it would be like to be close to God. And I think, man, that's, that's going to be good. That's really great for me. And so uh, that's, that's, that's big. We must remember that the purpose of knowing God's Word is so that we might know Him or God. That's the purpose of reading. So, I mean, that's one of the purposes of it. That's not the only purpose, of course. From 2 Timothy chapter 3, well, this is something we probably talk about a lot. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching. That's telling us what God's Word has, wants, what God wants of us. What we need to know about God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. About salvation, the church, the worship, Christian living, the hereafter. Of course, faith comes by hearing the Word. You'll recall that was be important. So, Problem for teaching, for reproof. Reproof is a word that, to me, it means that when I don't do things right, I get, some, I get a reprimand, if you would, that said, when I begin to read the Word, I begin to get an insight into, that wasn't good. I shouldn't be doing it. So that's kind of what reproof is. It's, it's something that say you can do better, and here's what you ought to be doing. What you ought to be doing is the correction part. So we can, we can hopefully we can straighten out and do better as we live each day. And so for the, the, third, the last part of training in righteousness, we must all be so trained. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You want to be equipped for every good work? It's got to be more than knowing Acts 2.38. It's got to be more than re- being read the Sermon on the Mount once in a while. It's got to be knowing what the Scriptures teach. And I think that's really important. If you've got gray hair on your head, I think, and you've got time, of course, you ought to be in the book every day. Now, sometimes, I know that you have to go to work. I've done that for years. I know that you've got a family you've got to take care of. I know that's important, too. But it's a prioritization to me. The most important is to choose to serve God. And I believe if you do that, you'll be a better husband and father than you would ever have been otherwise. And I think you'll probably be a better employee than you would have been otherwise, too, because Christians, when they go to work, they're diligent in working. I don't sit around and goof around and talk about the weather and the football games. and the, that, That's not my style. never was, and it, it would not be today. So Christians present a great opportunity to be prepared for every good work, and people see that, of course. Whoops. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul tells us that the Word of God teaches us how to walk with Christ. Well, we we certainly agree with that, I think. God's Word rebukes sin with which we struggle, calling us to repentance. And most of all, I think all of you have done that. Probably we do that from day to day. I think at least I I need to do that. But I I start out with the day. My, My day starts with prayer. Asking God to be with me and lead me through the day that I'll not do something really stupid. Because I'm fully capable. Are you? <laughs> yeah, but we might, you know, at times it just the slip of the tongue can just be disastrous if you're not careful. Now I get up early at my house, and if Jane comes down, well, sometimes she's just not very far behind me. But if I if I'm not too careful, I can be a real smarty. Now, is that the way to treat the person that loves you? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't do that on purpose, but I'm still learning. I'm a work in progress. So when I, when I try to do that, I, I try to learn from my day's activities. I don't do things on purpose, but I find it personally it's better for me to start out with the day asking me to help and lead me rather than it is at the end of the day and say, forgive me. So I need that too, of course, but I, that's my strategy. So God's Word corrects our path, training and equipping us for our journey with Jesus. Churches that shine spend time in God's Word. They seek answers from its pages. They surrender their lives to the precepts and principles about which God speaks. 
Being devoted to God's word means living under the authority of God, listening to the voice of God, and learning about the heart of God. I believe the scriptures let us see the very heart and nature of God. And so I'm interested in knowing about that. And I think you would be too. So it's, it's, effort, it's, it's important to be into that, I think. Well, not only were they devoted to God's word, but they were devoted to fellowship, another aspect of what we read in these few verses. Early Christians were devoted to each other. They loved each other as Christ loved them. Have you ever thought about, uh, at least it seemed to me, there were a lot of people from out of town that came to Jerusalem on the day, and they were there for Pentecost. And I suppose a good number of those out-of-towners became Christians. I wonder how they were received by the Christians that were there that lived in Jerusalem or Judea. Well, I know because I believe that they were devoted to fellowship with each other, you see. I, I, know, that they, I know they adjusted really quickly. And so that, I think that we learn from that. So they spent time in each other's home. They, from house to house, they went daily from house to house, and they ate their bread together and enjoying each other together as the family of God. So they were devoted to fellowship in that their fellowship must be, our fellowship must be shaped by the person and character of Jesus. Sharing life calls us to live out his standard and rec reflect his image. There are both, when we start, when we're involved in accountability, I mean, in fellowship, in, 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 uh, in fellowship, when we are associated with each other, this says, and I certainly agree with this, there's both accountability and encouragement in our connection with each other. There's accountability. When I come to your house, it would be really awkward for me to take off my shoes and socks and flop my table, my foot up there on your table and say, boy, this is really comfortable. I have, you know, nobody would expect that out of fellowship. We would say we want to do things that encourage each other. So my accountability when I'm with other Christians is pretty big. I want to be careful about what I say, what I do. Uh, I kid people a lot. I'm not sure. I may overdo that sometimes. You know, but I, I just enjoy life. I like to, you know, I, every day is a good day for me. And I may not be able to sing that same song tomorrow, but today it is. And the Lord has blessed me, and so I choose to look at that each way, that day, that way each day. But when I'm with you, when I see you, when I come in the door, there is accountability. I have a burden of accountability as with you, as you do with me, as you do with each other. Or when we go to somebody's home, we have, there's accountability about that, I think. And there's also encouragement. If I go to your home, I'm encouraged because you cared enough to say, why don't you come over and have a bologna sandwich with me? I can handle that really well. I, was, I ate an awful lot of bologna sandwiches when I was a little boy. So that, that's pretty good. Yes, Jeannie, please. Tonight at the dinner table, my daughter Christina was there and the girl from Finland is there. They were talking about a TV program that they both watch. They were very familiar with the characters in this TV program. A lot of us are really familiar with characters in TV programs. Maybe we know the people on Duck Dynasty really well. Maybe we would recognize their image. And I think sometimes we spend more time, and, and I'm guilty too, but I think we spend time with those kinds of things and we know more about them, almost an intimate acquaintance with somebody on a TV series, more than we know Christ. And because we're spending time watching and involving ourselves in the lives and talking to other people about that program. It's, we see it on, if you follow Facebook, you see it on Facebook. If you follow people, I just was, thinking about that conversation tonight at the dinner table and here from Finland to the United States they're watching the same program and they know this character on that show. We should be watching the same program. We, we need to be reading the same book. Like we can talk about a novel with one another, we should be able to talk about the word with one another because we're in there every day. Yeah, well, that's, that's really an excellent point. That's really true. Uh -huh. 
I think you make a point that just came to my mind is we know a lot more about that dynasty guys, and, but there may be here at the church we don't know their name. Right. Could that be true? Yes. yes. You see, I, I, well, you're part of the body, part of the family. And I don't even know your name, but I can sure tell you who's on the Whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I can't tell you who's on that I don't know either. <laughs> Well, one of, them, one, of, one of them came out to OC one day. We went out to see him, and I took my duck call. I was going to quack out there with all the body while we were waiting, and I thought, boy, there's going to be a whole lot of quacking going on out here. But I forgot it. And when I got out there, there was not a single quack except the guy that was part of the Duck Dynasty cast. Mike, please. Members of the Lord's Church who are... Uh, involved in producing good, clean entertainment uh, as opposed to what uh, is seen on TV uh, most of the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I ran across a guy at, uh, uh, I don't know, a restaurant here in town. I can't even think of the name of it now. And uh, uh, never met the guy before, but he had a Duck Dynasty shirt on, you know. <laughs> and he told me, I said, we should have more entertainment like that. Uh, whether he was a member, uh, were, uh, member of the Lord's Church, a Christian, or uh, or not, I don't know. But he was, he he felt like he was better off because he watched that program, and it uh, the program uh, was uh, uh, clean and and uh, entertaining without being vulgar. Yeah, there is. It's, I, I, what I've seen of it is, I believe it is a pretty clean show. Like I said, mm -hmm. once in a while they slip a little word in there that I wouldn't use. But that, that's TV, I guess. That's what you got to do to have people watching the show. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't personally care for it myself. I don't, I don't need the words, to hear words that are they're not really bad words, but they're, they're just a little bit off taste. Since I think those guys are members of the church and they're telling us about Fun. They, it's a good, morally, I think it's probably a pretty good show. I don't watch it much. I've seen it. But it I think the point somebody. was, Harold, that it wasn't a commentary on the show. It was more about us knowing them more intimately than we know each other. That's the point. You make That's the exact the point. point that I was going to get. We, we know more about those people than we do this side of the auditorium, mm -hmm. knowing this side of the you see, you see the point of fellowship? We're talking about fellowship. They were devoted to it. You see, you see what I'm trying to get to? It is really important. If we're a church family that's devoted to fellowship, there's a lot of things that, you know, I'm not so smart either. I, don't, I know everybody, but I don't know. Some of you have never been to your house. I wouldn't know whether you've got cigarettes on the table or not. I don't It's not my business. You have not care. It's but I, but I know quite a few of you pretty well. But I probably don't know all of you as well as I want to. And that's not your fault. <laughs> Whose fault is that? It's mine. we got a church director. I know where you live. If I don't know where you live, I can find you. We're trying to find Carlene's uh, son, Dennis, and Cynthia. And we got on the on well, the GPS, they didn't know where that street was. We got our James phone looking up the... They, that didn't know where the street was. We called Carlene and she gave us some instructions. We couldn't find it either. <laughs> so anyhow, the whole point of the matter is, if I want to know where you live, I can find you. I may have to look a little bit more than I would ordinarily, but I can find you. If what? Want to. Want to. If you want to. If you decide to take time to do that. Yes. You know where you can find where I live as well. You know, so fellowship, if we're devoted to that's pretty important. You see the point that I'm trying to get to? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of an introvert, sort of, not yes. quite, probably more so than she. She's a social butterfly. So it, so, so Congratulations. I, I, think I, understand, I think even as an introvert, understand the need for fellowship. But sometimes, because... I don't need fellowship, social, socializing. It's e more difficult for somebody in my, as my personality to 
to say, hey, let's go over to so-and-so's house. So she compliments me well because I might be dragging my feet over there, but at the end of the day, when I, when I do have that fellowship, it's edifying. Yeah. So some people's personalities are different. So we, you know, it's, it's what's your service in the church. Somebody may have a great opportunity to be a social butterfly and get people together when some of us may not have that talent. Yeah, you're, you're, so, exactly, you're exactly right. You're greatly blessed to have a beautiful young woman as your wife to help you, and she does, I believe. And so that's, you and, compliment each other in a great way. And just because I don't say a lot when I'm in a group doesn't mean I'm not having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> and, having, and having seen it, he is very gracious when she drags him kicking and screaming. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so, but yeah, if you really want to know me, I'm sort of a loner in a way myself. I could, uh, well, I, I shouldn't be a loner. <laughs> yeah. Well, I could be a loner if I wanted to be. Now, when, what you're talking about is exactly, I'm pretty much like that too. And, uh, but Jane is probably not, she's not a, a social butterfly, but she's a sweet hearted person. Uh, she, well, just, for, just as an example, uh, she tried to get a hold of uh, Geneva Coons. Who's going to get her Wednesday night last week and bring her to church? Well, Jane called her and talked to her. Went by Wednesday and get her. We couldn't get We mocked and mocked and mocked. Couldn't get her to come to the door. So we got back. She went to bed. We did. But Jane didn't give up. Boy, she. The next day she called. Then she didn't get her. The next day she called and didn't get her. The next day she called and didn't get her. And she, what do you think? She said, let's go see. So we went over to see. And so we called Steve Harrison. He has the key to her house. And when we got in, Geneva was asleep in there on the bed. We was looking for her. We knocked, we knocked. Oh my took goodness. the key, got in the house. She was laying on the bed down curling. I thought she was gone. But she was. And so we called, uh, uh, well, we, we, Steve got her something to eat. Steve's a good hearted man, too, right? Got her something good to eat. Jane and I went to the store and got her something brought back over. Went back the next day to see how she was doing. We couldn't get in. But I had a key this time. I'm a social butterfly. I had a key this time. And we got in. She was in there on the floor. Oh, my. Did you see that thing? I think she's lost her ability to take care of herself. Now, I, I'm not a... I, I'm not a social, really a social guy, but I, I can be pretty social as I need to be. Yeah. And you're like that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. But thank goodness we got women to help. So Jane didn't get up. Jane would not. Fuck this guy. Thank goodness for Jane. You see. Mm -hmm. So fellowship is really important. I think. Uh, what you just been covering was given well by Paul of Philippians 2, 19 through 21 in regard to Timothy, and he made a statement, I have no man like-minded who will truly care for your state, for they all seek their own things and not the things of Jesus Christ. Paul commended Timothy because he thought not in regard to what he was in, <laughs> but the mind of the other person. And uh, some of what you've been covering deals with that. If I could think and look through their eyes and not my eyes, I can help them all. Okay. Well, that's really true. Yes, sir. I think one of the difficulties sometimes that are, maybe I don't get back up here. In my humble estimation, some of the things that, whoa, I think, well, maybe I better back way up here, yeah. It made my viewpoint. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, this is not to be critical, but please take it for what it says. I think at times when the worship is over, we tend to congregate with those that we know, that we love. We're kind of in a, not a clique, really, I don't mean that. But we, instead of this side of the auditorium getting over and talking to this side, not that, well, unless you're, you're good friends over here, probably won't happen. Does that seem like that's a possibility to you? We see people, I see people I personally love. I'm great friends with them. 
but you're, you're all my family. We're all family to each other, you see. And so there, there is kind of a difficult line, I think, at times perhaps to fellowship with others. You know, I, uh, not sure how to say that really, but do you get the gist of what I'm trying to say? There are some people that I know better than others, and so consequently those that I know better are probably the ones that I'm going to spend my time with. You're like it. <clears throat> I think we're all kind of like it. <coughs> so, well, that's true. Everybody has a comfort zone. Yeah. But, yeah. but let, me, let me suggest this. The new, when the church was established, I think there were people with a, a shy, my comfort zone is, boy, I don't want to get out much. There are people just like we are that were there. And so, how did they, how were they involved? They were fervent in fellowship with each other, you see? But it takes a little, it, I think it takes effort, honestly. It's, it's not an easy sort of thing. You got comfort zones? Uh, I have comfort zone. I mean, I don't, I don't mind if you're, you may be a guy six foot six like uh, Jim Brandon. I hug Jim Brandon. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? He's, he's just a dear brother. I've known him for years. I hug you guys just about as often as I'd hug the women. But I, it's, it's just because you're my friends. That's just one little way. Yeah, I, <laughs> I locked the door before we leave. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about the two minute rule. The two minute rule says, well, first two minutes we try to see somebody we don't know. Maybe we need to change it to the first ten minutes we don't we don't leave unless we've talked to everybody we have to we get our rub our elbows with. I don't know what to do. But I believe the scriptures would teach that they, the church there, was devoted to fellowship with each other fellowship with the Lord. That's, a, that's something I think we can apply to ourselves too. That's all I'd really like to say about that. But I think it, it takes care. I want yes. to show you that my son John went to church at Black's Ferry Road Church on Sunday. And that's where the Dutch Dynasty people are. And Adam, the oldest boy, preached. And eight people were baptized and six were served. And if there are any words, you know, on the program, the network does that. They try to keep them from, they want them to hear much more stuff yeah. than they do. But they all preach. I've heard, you know, I have heard that at the end of the show, they usually get down with any family they have prayer. Yeah. Uh -huh. I've heard that the family insisted on that with the people, the producers of the show. Uh -huh. yeah. And so there you go, know, but they all preach the gospel. They all, all those boys preach, and that's where all it's really the country. All over the world, I guess, really doing good. They are making an impact. Yeah, I do. I think they're really good. I, 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 kind of like you are, I would relate little words that I think are kind of off color probably to the producers that produce the show. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I don't watch much TV at all, but that my son that lives in Elkhart, Kansas, they, they run home and right after Wednesday night services, they got Duck Dynasty on. They just enjoy the show. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. Well, uh, I'd like to move on here just a little bit. Ecclesiastes uh, 4, 9 through 12 talks about the idea that two are better than one because of their labor. If one falls, he has somebody to be with him and just one guy by himself doesn't survive as well. And uh, two can lie down and keep warm in the wintertime better than just one. Uh, we'd all know that to be true. So Ecclesiastes talks about a, a fellowship that binds us together in purpose, support, encouragement, strength. Churches that shine foster healthy spiritual relationships. They set aside time to be together. They encourage and invite people to walk 
daily in each other's lives. So we're trying to encourage us to walk more closely with each other in our daily lives. <clears throat> being devoted to fellowship means to being intentional about forming God-centered relationships. The key word there is being intentional about it. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's probably enough. I've said maybe more than I probably should have. But anyhow, I, I think it, I just feel it's, a, it's an important thing. And so uh, you would see that too. And they were devoted to it. If the church, when it was established, was devoted to it, then I think we must be devoted to it. And uh, I think we, we have to work at that, though. It's, it's like you said, like uh, you said, we got our own, we know we got our own boundaries. And uh, I've thought at times, really and truly, there is a level of love that I have with my family that nobody can get into. You may get on that, you may get on the next layer outside there, but you don't get into that it immediately. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I have thought that to be true in the past. I love you, but I don't love you like I love Jane. You see what I'm trying to get to? Not, not the, uh, uh, well, I just, I guess I'm trying to be really honest with you. I love you, and I want to, I want to love each one of you, and I want to love you as best I can. And I, I think we all want to love each other. And I realize that, that we have a level that within our, our, our sphere, our family, that's probably the love that, that nobody else gets into. But we can have really good friends, and the next layer around us can be filled with love and people that we care for and members of the church. And That's what I think I'm really kind of describing. And so I don't know I'd be dishonest with you to say I love you just like I love my wife. I don't. But I do love you. And it's the kind of love that says I'd do things to help you if I could. Yes. Bob, please. Because I think that's the kind of love that we can have with each other. You know, we can't have the, 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 the mate, you know, type relationship with each other, the intimacy. Yeah. But, but <clears throat> I love many of this family as much or more than my brother. Now, he is a state senator, so that does, you know. But anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, you know, I think that's, that, that is a relationship that we can approach, is that feeling of brother and sister. And, and I think that's where we were, they were talking about in Acts 2, is they became family immediately. And if they perceive a need or saw a need, so that's, and that's where being in each other's house is important because, you know, if, if I get over to somebody's house and I see the grass is four foot high, there might be some issue that I could help with, you know. Great. And, and, if, and if I have, if I've developed a relationship with them, I can ask. Yeah. But if I don't have that relationship, I can't say a word. And so I think that's why it's so important for us to work on at least a relationship every time we get here. Well, that's an excellent point. It's interesting that he talks about brother-sister relationships and not husband-wife relationships, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's rather significant to me, I think. We're not supposed to treat each other like husband and wife. We're, we're supposed to treat them better than brothers and sisters. <laughs> so it's a little different relationship. It's not that uh, intimate kind of thing that husband and wife has. It's not like uh, father-son, really. You know? it's, Brothers and sisters. See, that's the, that's the relationship that we're called on to live with. Okay. Well, they were devoted to forever. That's another thing that they were talking about. The cross of Jesus is central focus in the Christian's heart. His sacrifice infuses us with new life. His resurrection empowers us to walk with God. So when I begin to be involved in breaking of the bread or the, the Lord's Supper that we have each Sunday morning or Sunday evening if you're not available on Sunday morning, you missed out for some reason or another, we try to make sure everybody has the chance to do that. But there's a purpose in that, and that's the sacrifice. I think it helps us to continually keep before us what Jesus Christ has done for us. The breaking of bread has reference to participation in the Lord's Supper, this act of remembrance, celebration, confession, and proclamation is the core of our time together. 
sometimes called the communion. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, I believe it is, talks about it, the, the, the blood that we share. It's a sharing in the blood of Christ. It's a sharing in the body of Christ. So the word communion has kind of come into play on that. As we gather together at the shadow of the cross, breaking of bread reminds us who we are and how we came into the family of God. It energizes our walk as we find fresh forgiveness in the blood of Christ. It renews our focus and fuels our commitment to walk in the steps of Jesus. Uh, so I, I kind of personally, I think when we come together and we take bread, the communion, if you want to call it that, the Lord's Supper, it's kind of a renewal for us, isn't it? I, I believe it's a renewal. It's a time that you stop and remember. It's a re renewing of your remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. So I, I think that's important to be involved in it. Walking with God means leaving behind personal wants. It calls for self-sacrifice that imitates the sacrifice of Christ. Well, personal wants and personal needs are two different things, aren't they? And so I, I, uh, I, I think it's kind of important that we be careful about uh, everything we want. Most of us don't get everything we want to start with. But it's, it's a time that we view what God has done for us, and that has value, it has benefits. I think there's a self-sacrifice. If you're trying to be like Jesus Christ, there's self-sacrifice there, isn't there? Yeah, I think so. Churches that shine live at the foot of the cross. Being devoted to the breaking of bread demands that we remember the presence and the sacrifice of Jesus in our daily lives. His presence transforms our lives to be like His. So, when I, <coughs> excuse me, when I think about Jesus, I, uh, it's not just Sunday morning. It's every day. Part of life. We've been transformed. We're not the same person as we were before we were baptized. We have been transformed. We've been changed. We've volunteered to be changed. We've repented of our sins. Those sins are forgiven. We continually try to work on less and less of being involved in sin. First John says we fail, we forget, if we confess our sins, He's faithful to forgive us our sins. We can continue to grow and keep growing and still be in that relationship with Jesus Christ. So our lives are being transformed. No doubt about that. At least I, I don't believe they are. So the, also they were devoted not only in uh, the, the, the teaching of the apostles and fellowship, breaking bread, they were also devoted in prayer. That was another important point that was made. Prayer is a place where we meet God and pour ourselves out before Him. In prayer we quiet our hearts, learning to listen, rely on the love and fullness of God. Prayer is the act of deep surrender. Do you feel like you're surrendering to God when you pray? Oftentimes, our prayer is, Father, I need this, and I need this, and this person's sick, and they need help, and this, we need, we need, we need, we need, we need. Well, we do. But I think at the top of the list is, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I am so grateful for Him, what He's done for me. We had, last Christmas, when we got together, our family, one of my daughters, we, I, I led the prayer for dinner. And it was Christmas Day, I believe it was. And she said, Dad, how could you forgot Jesus Christ? This is his birthday. Well, uh, okay, it's it, maybe so. I don't think so, but I wouldn't really argue that point. Because Christmas is a celebration. For, but my point to her was, I don't remember Jesus Christ just on Christmas Day. And, of course, she doesn't either. She lives a really dedicated life, and her whole family does too. But her point was, how could on a special day you forget Jesus Christ? And I did, really. But day by day, each day when I pray, I am grateful for Jesus Christ. That's probably the first thing I say. That's just, that's just me now, of course. You can do as you need to, the way you want to do that. But uh, I'm thankful for Jesus Christ Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and Sunday. In my prayer. I don't go around and say, well, you know, if I change my mind, I'll tell you. I love you. I'm sure glad uh, that I'm saved. 
But if I change my mind, I'll tell you about it. But just don't, I won't say any more to you about it. But, you know, I don't do that at all. Jesus Christ is important when I pray every time. Even when we pray for our meal at, our, at my house, <laughs> we're praying for the meal, of course, but I've got a lot of the things that I think I'm so thankful for. Prayer for me, for the most part, is a prayer of thanksgiving. I'm glad for Jesus Christ. I'm glad for my family. I'm glad for the church family. I'm glad for what Jesus has done for me. His promises, His forgiveness, there's hope of salvation for me. Hope of heaven someday. So I'm not so much in, I need this and I need that. And oftentimes I get through it and I say, well, I could. why didn't you say something about that? I just, you see, what I want and what I think I need is really important. But oftentimes I get so mixed up, not mixed up, <laughs> so focused on what I'm thankful for, a lot of times I don't remember to ask for some of the things I probably should be. But I do, I always ask for my family and their well-being and their, I want everybody to be faithful Christians, my grandchildren. Those are really important things. But my life is not so much, I need this, I want this, I need your help. I'm just thankful for what I got, what I get. And that's enough for me. Yes, ma'am. needs to include our future with Christ yeah. and that's difficult because we live here when Jesus disciples asked him to teach us to pray what did he say okay, he said now okay now what I just said you said well wait a minute what are you doing Pray this way, then. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I don't pray thy kingdom come because I believe the kingdom is already here. I might pray that it, it continues to advance, and expand, and grow. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't sure like to see it that way tonight. I think there's so much sin in the world. But I can still ask. Did he teach the disciples how to pray? He said the Lord's will would be the most important thing. Okay. I don't care if you say so around here tonight. The first encounter to the Church of Christ was in Washington County when my almost grandmother said, If you don't go to the Church of Christ, you're going to hell. Just like that. Just sent me back a few days. It was pretty hard to send me back. The Church of Christ is wonderful. It's organized. If you've never been lost, you don't know how good it feels to be saved. <coughs> I'm glad I'm here. I still see Sunday school sometimes because I've been through everything before I got here. This is Wednesday night prayer meeting. No, it's about Everybody here ain't just alike. We're all different, but we're here for the same reason. Yeah, we certainly are. So, we do the agenda school on Sunday, right? Bible school on Sunday, so we don't pay me by calling the Sunday school. I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, but I think it's important to pray for the people that are in the Maybe I should read this again. <laughs> what do you say? You just pray. Give us this day our daily bread. The things that sustain us through life. Who gives us that? Well, the Lord doesn't give me that. I'll go out and work for mine. Ha, huh, who gives you the ability to work? Who, who could take it away from me just like that? Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors or those that uh, forgive us for our sins as though that sin against us. That's a pretty big, powerful point, isn't it? He taught us that too. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That last verse is not in some of the oldest 
scripture copies that we have, but it's, it's, it's there anyhow. It's, it's important, I think. So, now I've, I've said personally that I'm not so much into, I need this, I need that, I, help me with this. Well, these kind of things here are, I need these kind of things, don't I? But they're, they're not the big focus in my life, you see. That's, that's the significant point, I think. So the teaching his disciples to pray, Jesus shows us how God longs to touch every part of our lives. God calls us to let him have control of our spiritual lives, our material possessions, our emotional stability, and our relationship with others. Churches that shine are connected to God in prayer. Being devoted to prayer means setting aside time for God each day. They were devoted in prayer, weren't they? You see? So if, I, if I'm not, like there's always room for improvement. We've still got another day to breathe, perhaps. You know what? We can always change. We can do better. If I, if I got a target I'm right here working toward and I get closer to that target, I'm doing better. You see, that's, that's the significance of the Christian life, I think. So being devoted in prayer means uh, setting aside time for God each day. Being devoted in prayer or to prayer invites God to be involved in every part of our lives. Pretty important. So, as the church in the first century devoted themselves to God's word, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer, a change came over the group. Their devotion connected them in a bond of unity. They were together and had all things in common. Their lives became so intertwined that things were like possessions and time and food came to be seen not as personal treasures to be hoarded, but rather as avenues for love and service. The church looked more like a family than anything else. Churches that shine share life. They become a family, a group that is less concerned about self than they are more, they're less concerned about self than they are about those around him. When the church shares life, they become a place that God uses to draw others in relationship to him. A place of love is a place of warmth, a place of acceptance, a place of accountability. People came into contact with his love in the form of a group who shared life in Christ. God added to the church those daily that were surrendering their lives to him. Bible study teaches us to listen to the voice of God. Prayer moves us into his presence. Breaking the bread unites us around his table. And fellowship links our hearts and lives and other Christians to other Christians as we learn to walk more closely with Jesus. That's it. I really appreciate your time. You've, you've been very helpful to me. Thank you.